Settle in, class. We're back to my specialty, monsters. As a thing that goes bump in the dark who finds creatures fascinating, everyone's favorite beasties and besties are my area of expertise. Today, we're learning the basics. What those tags do, making and running encounters, basically everything else you need to get started. We have a lot of ground to cover, but it'll go quick. You ready? Let's go. So first things first, we gotta find the monster. They're mostly in alphabetical order, but closely related creatures are grouped. Golems, goblins, nushies, they're all grouped together. It'll give a descriptor of what they all generally are, but the individual monsters will still get descriptions just like everyone else. What they do, what they like, sizes, weights, that sort of stuff. If it's something that can be created like a ghost or a were creature, it'll show you how to do it here. Past that, of course, we have the stat plot. And you might already know how to read this because look, an actual template with explanation of every aspect that can be in a monster stat block. Now I know that sounds basic. Why wouldn't you explain the rules on monsters in a rule book on monsters? But apparently not. For D&D 5e, I had to make one myself because eight years in, none existed. Last I checked, it's my most popular Tumblr post. Anyway, if this isn't clear enough, or you'd rather just listen, I gotcha. Right there at the top, you got the name and level of the creature. I'll go over it a bit more when we're building encounters, but you compare the level of the monster you're using to the level of the party as a major aspect of encounter building. Below that, we have tags. First is how rare a monster is, left blank if it's common. Next is the alignment, which they're about to remove, but serves as a quick reference for how the average creature acts. Lawful to chaotic for how they value planning and rules. And good to evil for selflessness to selfishness. Won't be on future stat blocks, but useful if you see old adventures or homebrew. Next, we have size. Tiny is smaller than 2 feet, small is 2 to 4, medium 4 to 8, large to 16, huge to 32, and gargantuan for everything else. If it has any other traits, like being an angel or amphibious, it'll go here at the end. It's mostly just used to tell your demons from your devils, but good to know in case the players have a spell that just targets animals or something. Next junk is pretty self-explanatory. Perception is the perception score in any extra senses like dark vision, the languages they speak, skills and abilities that affect them, and attributes or ability modifiers depending on the age of the stat block. Following that is their weaponry and gear, and any abilities or afflictions that might mess with how they interact with people. So to recap with an example, an ancient blue dragon is a level 18 creature. It's uncommon, so there shouldn't be many, but you might have at least heard of them. They're between 16 and 32 feet long, and they're an electric dragon. They have dark vision and can smell when creatures are within 60 feet, with a pile of skills and languages and stats. They don't usually carry weapons, and can mimic anything they hear to mess with the party. And the rest of the stat block is for combat. AC and saving throws come next, with any special modifiers listed next to them. HP comes with anything that affects it like healing, and any immunities or damage resistances following. Then comes anything that could happen outside their turn like automatic effects and reactions. Following that is your movement types and speeds, and any actions or attacks. Relevant bonuses from gear already factored in. They're listed in order of melee, then range, then different kinds of spells. Finally, we have any miscellaneous offensive abilities or ones they can use on their turn. For example, we'll look at this two-headed troll. It has 24 AC with bonuses to all saves, but especially fortitude. 190 HP, but regenerates 25 per round and thus hit with acid or fire. It's weak to fire, taking 10 extra damage when hit. They can regrow severed heads, take attacks of opportunity, and run at 30 feet per action. They have melee attacks, a ranged club throw, and a special action if both their claws land. Note that most monsters work off the same three action system as players. Exceptions are rare and will say on the stat block. In this case, the troll only gets two actions, but each head gets its own turn. Now the stats themselves are for your eyes only, but your players might want to know what they're up against. So much so that they might spend some time mid-combat to figure it out. Recall knowledge might let them know what it is, basic information, or even something specific like a reaction trigger if they're good enough. Try to factor in the rarity when you set the DC, but one of the primary factors is what lore skill they're using for it. Ultimately, it comes down to your brain to figure out how relevant their skill is, but a good baseline is using the creature type. Demons and angels might be easiest to identify with religion, or constructs with crafting. And I know there's a chart, but get creative. Plant creatures will usually be nature lore, but if someone wants to use their herbalism instead, let them have it for a penalty. Now, there are quite a few creature types, but most are self-explanatory, like plants or giants or dragons. However, there are a few I'd like to specially mention. Animals are normal creatures like tigers and birds. They might be a bit fantastical, like the giant saber-toothed toad known as a slurk, but they're unintelligent and fairly mundane. A beast, on the other hand, is intelligent and often magical, despite usually resembling an animal. This is your unicorn, chimera, hydra. Most of the other creature types are just noting the plane a creature came from. They're often self-explanatory, but the one you might not be familiar with if coming from another system is the monitors. Think of them like a neutral midpoint between celestials like angels and fiends like demons. They have a cosmic prerogative like sorting petitioning souls or upholding the laws of physics, and don't really care about morality. Anyway, the point is that your players will probably want to know about the creatures you throw at them. The type gives you a quick reference on whether their goblin lore is actually relevant, though it's usually pretty fun to hear them reason out why it should work. But before they can do that, we have to make an encounter for them to question, using our handy monster level system. Now there's nothing that can plan for every monster combination and your party's playstyle, but the system's based on such solid math that it's actually pretty consistent. So once you run 
run a few encounters, you get a feel for what you need. As for actually designing them, I use the system of who, what, where, and why. But let's make sure we understand the mechanics first. To start, let's pick with what type of encounter we want to make. And I need D&D converts especially to pay attention here. Trivial encounters might do some damage, but have little actual risk to the party. Low threat will hurt, but shouldn't pose risk of death. Moderate is the standard and probably won't kill you, but if you're not careful, you're gonna need a rest afterward. Severe is for bosses. Play on your A game or run, cause you are in danger and have a legitimate chance of death. And finally, extreme. At this point, they are approaching even ground. This is for moments like end bosses where it's clear that they can go Nova and throw their entire arsenal out. What you need to remember is that monster levels act like player levels. Every level you go above the party has a higher average of hitting and critting a player. And if you avoid that by using multiple weaker monsters, now you have more turns which can even out to be just as bad. To help yourself avoid running into too many issues, I suggest looking at this chart for your budget and buying creatures with XP. You're assuming a standard party size of 4, but you can add or subtract to adjust for different sizes. As for how much XP a creature is worth, it's all relative to your party. A Stegosaurus is a moderate challenge for a level 5 party, but you'll need a pair to take on level 8, and by 11 if you don't bring the whole herd they're barely worth mentioning, though you'll rarely throw out one creature against the whole party. Make it two tough creatures, or a big one with pets or minions. Variety is key. Just try to stick to the guide while you get your bearings. And now that we understand the basic mechanics, let's look at some of the deeper ones while going over the four steps of encounter creation. Who are we fighting? Where are we fighting them? Why are we fighting? And what makes this memorable? These are four questions to ask yourself with nearly every encounter. Usually you'll already have the answer to at least one and just build out from it. If you don't have anything, I recommend starting with whatever you're feeling inspiration with. But let's see how it looks to start with each. For me, who are you fighting means digging through the bestiary with an appropriate level range and seeing what we got. But if you already have an idea of what you're looking for in a monster, I recommend either checking the back of the book for a list of monsters by type and level, or checking an online resource like Archives of Nethys. All 2,600 published monsters with the ability to sort by range, trait, sense, etc. Look through the actions and auras and lore, you're bound to find something interesting. Once you've found a monster who strikes your fancy, either find a creature who works well thematically, or one whose abilities interact in interesting ways. An aura ability with someone who can keep them pinned close, ranged attacks with flying enemies, just remember that this can increase your difficulty. Also, unless you're in a rush, I recommend you don't go with the first thing you find. Keep on looking and grab a bunch of creatures that could work well. This lets you change course a lot easier if you get inspired in a later step and need to mess with your plans. Second question is where we're fighting them. This is usually the easiest as you're normally aware of where the party is. And I don't just mean the biome, if you can get more specific, do it. Do you want this fight to be by a cliff or a river or a path? Maybe it's in the temple they're headed toward or on a random stretch of road. You can always come back at the end, but the next steps are a lot easier if you add some detail. For instance, if you specifically know that you're looking for a river battle in the forest outside of town, a river drake ridden by a lizard folk raider seems great. Built in stakes too. They're headed away from town, so taking them out and bringing back the body might make the party some grateful friends. Speaking of which, that's question three. Why haven't you hit lichens and why are they fighting? Are they being paid or hunting for rare materials or exploring for treasure? And I don't just mean the party. Why are the monsters fighting and how does that clash? If they're fighting because both parties want the treasure, the enemy might run when it gets to low health. If the party's after an artifact that's in its nest, it'll fight hard but it might not chase them. But if that material they want happens to be one of her children, she will fight to the bitter end. Knowing the monster's motivation might lead to a bargain or there might be something far more complicated going on than the party realizes. Knowing this goal can inform what location is best suited for the mission and what monsters would make it most interesting. If they're trying to hunt the creature down, you might want to look for interesting mobility options. But if they're trying to defend the town from it, you might look for things that can interact with walls. A monster guarding its nest might have environmental hazards, but if they're trying to guard something long term, there's room for traps or a cult. Just don't forget that the player's goal is only half the conflict. Now the last question is what? What makes this memorable? This one's for your traps and gimmicks. If you started here, you probably already had an idea. An item that can turn on a dead magic zone. A really bad pun you want to physically inflict on your party. Or maybe you're just dead set on pushing people off cliffs. And this doesn't just have to be traps and pitfalls and environmental hazards. The enemies worship the long lost god of this temple, and it grants them all an ability or a spell or a boon. Your monster breathes fire, so you've given all the goons jars of oil. And a battle dancer is also nothing. Sometimes you just need a palate cleanser. It can get a little exhausting if everything has 15 gimmicks. Whatever you do, once you've answered all the questions, you can look at how everything interacts and refine what you started with. Maybe there's a different creature option that gels better with the environment. If not, this is time to tweak your option and make it fit better, either by changing the description or making a local variation suited for the area. Or maybe it doesn't fit in and that's the point. The locals want this internal for gone, or the fact that the brine dragon is this far from sea is your mystery and concern all by itself. And if you started with another option, that'll be its own set of tweaks, changing the gimmick to work better with the environment, or tweaking where they're going to reflect where your monster would lair. And no matter what, I recommend looking at the particular party you're running for, if at all possible. There is little more panic-inducing than realizing you've locked them in a pit with something they can't actually damage.
Which, not that I would know anything about that. And with that, we have our encounter. Of course, you want more than one, but the following ones are dead simple. You probably already know the where. Your last fight was leading to it, or the other way around. Who was the hardest, but you should have some leftover monsters that didn't make the cut from last encounter. I said to get multiple for a reason. Your what and your why don't have to be similar, but they often will be. I especially like building off what makes this special, as players might struggle to remember battles after a while, but a shared complication makes this far easier, and lets you explore the mechanic in different ways. Like having one encounter with hidden pit traps, and the next have open pits, but the creatures are great at pushing people. Maybe your third one has both, or fills the pits with angry rats or bubbling tar. And try to vary the difficulty in these encounters. If everything's an ultra-hard boss fight, it can just get exhausting. And if you always just ramp up in power every day, it gets predictable. Give them time to rest, vary the enemy amounts, and let the difficulty rise and fall. Throw in the main boss as one of the first encounters, and now they have to get back on half a tank with the security system on. And by the way, word to the wise, if you're struggling to find a monster that fits just right, they don't know what stat block you're using. You might say you're using a goblin, and the info and lore and behavior is all goblin, but the stat block you're using is a deep gnome with a goblin tag. You want a dire kobold, so you grab a lizard folk. Problem solved. You can even change the abilities. Give that lizard folk hurried retreat, so it really feels like a giant kobold. Though I do recommend you get some experience before tweaking anything major. And if you need to tweak something just a little, change its health by the amount on the chart, and almost every other number by two. Four of its damage on an ability with limited use. Once you've got all these encounters made, we need to put them together. A lot of this will be covered by your overall plot, or just be obstacles in the way of your main encounter. But here's a more advanced tip. Try to make sure that at least one party member has a reason to be invested. You've been paying attention to the fighter, and you know they're obsessed with saving puppies. The ruins have an artifact that ties into your wizard's backstory. Offering money works fine, of course. But if the ranger collects rare eggshells, then maybe the guardian's nesting season was last week. And this just goes for rewards in general. Try to make sure that among the golden fame, the party gets more personal loot. It doesn't have to be something huge, just something intended for them. Also, don't just tie the party into the adventure, make sure you're drawing the players in as well. My rule of thumb is that everyone has at least one moment to shine per session. You're gonna have days when things are mostly suited for one person, but things should even out over the campaign. In combat, this could mean that you leave a group of minions for the wizard to blast away, or a careless guard for the rogue to assassinate. Out of combat, this might be charming an uptight barkeep, or finding out some information on the way forward, or getting a cool trinket from the local temple. And if you don't have any combat that session, still try to bring in the combat-focused players. Bring up the barbarians stays at sea for knowledge of creatures or talking with a retired fisherman. This is your time to bring up that random lore or language that nobody else has. Now, as for actually running combat itself, my tip for the start is to group similar enemies and to roll their initiative during planning. That way you aren't trying to keep those numbers straight in your head while everyone else is yelling out theirs. But my main trick for combat is how to end it. Remember when we decided why they fight? That matters most here. Not every fight needs to be swinging until one side stops moving. Maybe your monster immediately runs if it grabs someone. It just wanted food. The kobold are fine with a few people dying, but once half are gone, they all run. And if the players lose, do they actually die? Maybe what they thought was a party wipe has them waking up in cages. Or they're perfectly fine, just down some valuables. Now the mission's on hold while they get their stuff back. Or try to make it back to town unarmed. Or maybe they do actually die, and some sort of deity or demon offers to bring them back to life for a price. How you end a fight can matter just as much as the fight itself. Some players love interrogating and taking hostages, while others just want to fight and move on. And that's advice for every aspect of the game, to be honest. Keep an eye on the players and ask afterward what they liked. Different people adventure for different reasons, and balancing everyone's likes is your key to a happy game. Now this is a give and take on both sides of the table. The party members need to be accommodating to each other as well, even if it means they're momentarily out of the loop. But as the GM, try to ensure that it is just for a moment. Now a lot of this can be skipped entirely by trying to find out what everyone wants out of this before the campaign begins. Try to get everyone on the same page about whether this game is nuanced intrigue, or beer and pretzels kick in the door and forget about your day. That said, even with constant in communication, sometimes people just don't understand each other, or don't actually want what they thought they did. There might be someone who has to join no matter how much they conflict, or someone's just having a really bad day and getting frustrated with something they're normally down for. Try to keep others in mind when you're planning, and don't be afraid to cut something short if people are getting frustrated. After all, trying to make sure that others have fun is part of every player's role. And if that sounds overwhelming, notice what I said there. Role of every player. You have some more expectations and a different dynamic, but you are a player. You're supposed to be having fun too, and they should be looking out for you as well. Now it's gonna look different, you're playing their opposition even more than you are their allies, but sometimes the players need to throw the GM a bone and banter with the villain, cause their fun's about to come when they tear the boss apart. But sometimes your players might need to be reminded, cause it's easy to forget that you aren't on teams. They might not have really realized it to begin with, especially if they're kinda new or mostly no live shows. Some people think it's the GM's job to do practically everything, but unless you're charging money, it's not your job to do jack. You're doing this to have fun, same as everyone else. You either find this role fulfilling, like so many do, or you're doing it as a favor because you like them. If you're not feeling satisfied, talk to the group
group about what's bothering you and try to come to a compromise. It's cooperative storytelling with some shiny rocks. Collaboration is the name of the game. Anyway, sorry I kept putting this off for class videos. I had to scrap and redo the script twice. Once of my own doing, and once because it was wrecked for reasons out of my control. He said I was sorry. I can never stay mad at you. Anyway, I'm holding off on more Pathfinder until after the revisions actually come out sometime this year. And I kinda just want to have all these 5e classes done. Then we can go back to monster stuff. And maybe Pathfinder classes if you like. Oh god, am I becoming addicted? Not as addicted as I am to my coffee. Link in the description. Big thanks to Feral Goblin, Eldenier95, and Modern Masquerade. You keep me peeled up and learning. Anyway, class dismissed. Have you seen Guck? No, he took the day off. My shipment's running late, so I can't brew him more headache potions. I keep telling him that hat of his is cursed or something. Probably broke it when he jammed his horns through. It's supposed to be a helmet of fine traps, but its definitions are so loose it even counts music or an overpriced vending machine. I've never seen it stop going off. I have. Really? Well, that answers my question. I only see him at his house, my house, and work. His house is more trapped than wall, and of course my hut is rigged to blow, but I was never sure why it's always going off at work. I thought it just considered my job a trap. Guess it makes sense, the boss is a co- Bold. Wait, your houses? You hang out after work? Yeah, bars are overpriced and restrictive, so we just drink at our houses sometimes. Why? Wanna join? Oh, think about it. Can I join? Sure. How old are you? 29. Huh? 